Um, what do you think uh, are the potential benefits and risk related to the treatment with medical cannabis? Well, you know, there are a lot of uh, potential benefits and there are probably as many potential risks. What if I could uh, sum up everything in one sentence, I don't want to sound glib, but I would say the risks are um, not as bad as people thought they were, mm -hmm. but also the benefits are not as great as people thought they like were. Like a magical pill, right? Yeah, right. Yes. So it is a kind of a mixed bag. One has to make the decision based on the disease, based on the person, mm -hmm. based on, on information, and yeah. we don't have a whole lot of that. Yeah. But it, it, again, if I had to single out a couple of conditions for which uh, most scientists are in agreement that there is uh, substantial evidence or conclusive evidence that uh, cannabis can be at least beneficial mm -hmm. to certain patients. Yeah. Uh, the conditions, the three conditions that come immediately to mind are nausea induced by particularly by, uh, Chemo. by chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. uh, on that, I think the evidence is conclusive yeah. and you know, there is even a drug on the market, you know, yeah. the tronabinol, uh, which is THC. And, but it's not a really good drug, mm -hmm. so I, I think you know, we need better formulations and for patients it. patients prefer cannabis. Um, yeah, because yeah. they can titrate it better. They mm -hmm. can actually get as much as they want yeah. without the side effects. They can just get enough of, yeah. for example, by smoking or inhaling it, they can get just enough of it without getting high. Effect, yeah. Because, you know, no, no, you know these, these folks don't want to get high. Yeah, they want to sure. get rid they of the problem. The, yeah. Yeah. They yeah. want to be able to interact normally yeah. with yes, people. Exactly. Yeah. So that's nausea. Then the second one is pain, mm -hmm. the chronic pain. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the evidence is not conclusive, but it's substantial. So there is uh, there are a lot of clinical studies that have been done with cannabis, with cannabinoids. None of them is conclusive in the sense they are relatively small studies. As you can imagine, pharmaceutical companies do not typically fund these studies. Mm -hmm. They are self-funded or using you know federal uh, NIH or uh, NIH-like type of studies. Mm -hmm. Um, so they cannot be very large, um, but they are there, and you know if you consider them uh, in aggregate, the um, I, I think the, the conclusion is that yes, there is a there is a fairly substantial evidence that it works. In the case for in the case of pain control, we know how cannabis works mm -hmm. because there are literally tens of thousands of studies, mm -hmm. thousands of studies on pain and cannabis and endocannabinoids. We know how important the endocannabinoid system is in control of pain, as I said before. So that's the second one. The third is um, rigidity and spasticity in multiple sclerosis. And for that also, yes. the evidence is pretty good. Um, I would say not conclusive, but substantial. The reason is because actually the spasticity itself mm -hmm. is not really Im improved, mm -hmm. but the way People live with spasticity, yeah. but people like they don't mind as much. Ah, yeah. yeah, you're right. Yeah, so these are benefits. The risks, well, the risks are, you know, as I said, they are not as terrible as some people, some politicians in particular, yes. would like us to believe. Yes. Uh, I, I don't think that they are that terrible. The first one is, um, and it, it is actually smoking or using cannabis while pregnant. Okay. Uh, this is a very good point. Yeah, or while you, uh, one is uh, lactating. Yes. Say, yeah. The other condition is used in adolescents. Oh, yes. And why is that the case? Well, you know, I think it's important to understand that the endocannabinoid system is really darn important. Every time there is a movement in our brain, a change, the endocannabinoid system is there to help modulate it. Uh -huh. So when is it that the brain has major changes? Well, one first change is during adolescence because we have a lot of synapses. So that's a critical point. Another critical point in our life is when uh, we, after maybe 50 or five or 60, depends on, you know, on, on uh, many uh, components, many things, many factors. So if we are messing up with the endocannabinoid system at the time where it's really useful, what's going to, what's going to happen, right? So with adolescents, the data that we have suggests that is actually going to be a problem, mm -hmm. but the data are not enough yet. Yet, so I don't want to scare anybody. It, it, it's not that oh, if you smoke a joint or you have, you know, you use a a pill or you take a, you know, then you're going to be ruined for life. Then it's probably not the case. But I again, I want to err on the side of uh, of cautiousness. Mm -hmm. It's okay if a, if a teen 
uh, experiments once or twice, mm -hmm. I don't think he or she is going to be affected in the long term. And kids want to try that. Yeah. But if you, it becomes a habit, if it's something that, you know, it is every day, uh, yeah. every day uh, it, it is bound to have say, some kind of long term effect. Mm -hmm. it, that would be, we don't have proof of it yet, mm -hmm. but that would be my mm, educated guess at okay. this point. In, a, in, in a aging, in the aging population... It can be good, right? It could be good. Yes. It could be good. We don't know that. We have some data. There are some data suggesting that, yeah. and they are interesting. What happens in the aging brain is that there is this thing called inflammaging. Yeah. So there is inflammation that goes along with the fact that, you know, as we grow old, our in, in immune cells in the brain tend to over act, be overly active. So the cannabinoid drugs, by acting on the endocannabinoid system, may regulate in this inflammation, may decrease inflammation. In adulthood, which is in between these two things, you know, I think probably, you know, as moderate use is probably not going to be very, very risky. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, there are specific conditions under which we have to be careful. Mm -hmm. People with a history of psychosis, and for example, are cer certainly folks who I would not um, recommend they use it. Now, this said, mm -hmm. they do use it. Mm -hmm. But 50% of them do, and those who use it have, as has been shown, they actually have improved cognition. Okay. So uh, it is a complex thing because with schizophrenia, what I think has been shown now very, very clearly yeah. is that heavy use, especially in early, early onset use, so starting early, starting young as an adolescent, as a, even in pre, in preteen years, that is a risk factor. There is a complicating factor there. Um, why are these kids using it, and uh, it, are, is, are they self-medicating in some some problem and be making it worse by self-medicating? So very very it's, complex, yeah, very very complex, very complex issues. Made it even more complex by the fact that now, if you are a fully established adult who, with schizophrenia, which is definitely not a thing you want to be. It's an extremely devastating disorder. Um, apparently, cannabis helps people focus. Hmm. Focusing more, maybe some connections are a little bit quicker. Uh -huh. um, you know, THC has some effects also on uh, And by the way, cannabidiol, uh, pure yes. cannabidiol seems to be fairly, fairly useful like uh, um, to improve cognition uh -huh. and some symptoms of of psychosis, the studies are very still very limited. Uh, one last thing: driving under the influence. Uh, okay, sure. Thank, Thank you, you so much. So much. It was really, really.